acres of crops, about 40% of that is irrigated, so about 2 million acres is irrigated. Uh, in uh, 1991, uh, that area, the upper 26 counties, uh, had a production of wheat uh, greater than 2 million acres, uh, more than 600,000 acres of corn, sorghum, and cotton. The same area also produced about 4 million head of fed beef cattle, and about 25 commercial crops are grown in this particular area, including vegetables and, and other things that we haven't mentioned. The, this area has a uh, cash receipts in terms of just agricultural products in excess of $5.2 billion in 1991. Uh, those are the latest figures I have. Uh, of that, about 80% of that uh, cash receipts comes from the fed beef industry, and uh, if you're not native to this area, just kind of drive between here and Hereford or someplace like that, and uh, you'll smell the money as you go along the way, okay? Uh, that will be no problem. And I guess uh, in terms of uh, the crops, there's four major crops that make up that, that major amount of cash receipts on the crop side. Those are wheat, sorghum, corn, and cotton. And depending upon the environmental conditions for any particular year, those kind of flip-flop and turn around and et cetera. If we have a bad hailstorm uh, during the wheat season, uh, we don't have as much wheat production as we do in other years and, and that type of thing. And I think the, if the one point that I could drive home that would be the best one would be that these upper 26 counties of the state of Texas occupy about 10% of the land area of Texas. But they produce 42% of the agricultural resource, re, uh, receipts for the state of Texas. So 10% of the area produces almost half of the agricultural research, uh, receipts for this area. And that's a point we'd like to drive home downstate uh, to the legislative people uh, when uh, they think about West Texas. They basically think that we're out here in this hot, dry, windy area, uh, 75 miles between everything, uh, that type of thing. And so I think we need to really uh, drive that point home to them. Uh, so I'll conclude my little part and we'll go on with the rest of the program. Uh, our first uh, speaker on the, on the panel today is Mr. Rodney Mosier. He's a graduate of uh, West Texas A&M University, majoring in ad business and economics. For the past 10 years, he's been the executive uh, assistant for the Texas Wheat Producers Association, which is located here uh, in Amarillo. And uh, they are the market development, research, and education organization for the commodity wheat the state of Texas. Uh, he serves a uh, host of many international, technical, and government foreign trade teams and develops schedules to satisfy their interest in international wheat marketing. Uh, he's recently participated in an international wheat marketing and projection study tour for Europe, the Middle East, which and the Middle East, which took him to Russia, Latvia, Estonia, Jordan, Egypt, and London. So without any further ado, Rodney. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for that introduction. We are all here uh, today to talk about uh, export strategies and uh, international business in the 1990s. It has been mentioned in uh, some of the correspondence that the U.S. is exporting 20% of its national uh, output. I represent uh, wheat producers in Texas where we export 90% of our product primarily uh, due to the proximity to the uh, Port of Houston. <coughs> Nationally, we export approximately 60% of the wheat that is grown and of course consume 40% domestically. But in the uh, Texas Panhandle, where 60% of the wheat is grown in Texas, for every $10 generated by wheat, Nine dollars of those are because of our foreign markets overseas. We have heard how you can market individual products into the foreign marketplace. My discussion today will be more in line with market development and service to the wheat industry. 
I represent the Texas Wheat Producers Board, which is a 15-man <coughs> producers board elected statewide by producers under the Commodity Referendum Law. Under uh, this uh, checkoff law, which is, uh, by the way, one penny per bushel statewide, these funds can only be used for market development, research, and education. The largest effort of the uh, Texas Wheat Producers Board continues to be our overseas market development work. We do not buy or sell wheat. Our job is to, to uh, develop markets for our wheat. Um, we accomplish this by supporting uh, an organization in Washington, D.C. Um, called U.S. Wheat Associates. This is an organization supported by the Texas Wheat Producers Board and 17 other wheat states to carry on our overseas market development work. Uh, the budget for U.S. Wheat Associates is determined by a funding formula, formula based on a five-year average production in each state with matching funds come to, coming from the uh, Foreign Agricultural Service. Uh, for every dollar that pro producer funds that goes into U.S. Wheat Associates, two dollars is generated from the Foreign Agricultural Service um, to help us with our market development work. Of course, these funds help us uh, with our uh, fund, help fund and support our Washington headquarters, along with 15 overseas foreign offices. Uh, they, those offices, uh, in turn, work on developing trade, uh, trade servicing, uh, milling and baking, uh, work on uh, developing our milling and baking skills overseas for market development. And, uh, but anyway, this is in hope that we will create a demand for our market. One of the more important things that we do, and one of the more important things and, and the things that I enjoy doing, and that is hosting our foreign trade teams that come to the uh, Texas and to the U.S. Uh, many of our uh, overseas foreign offices, as I mentioned, we have 15. Uh, we do have a, uh, a marketing plan uh, annually, which is about a year in advance, where they plan these foreign teams to come to the U Texas and the U.S. Uh, this year, uh, I've hosted some uh, 15 to 20 foreign trade teams in Texas uh, this past year. Uh, in fact, I've had about three trade teams just this past uh, month, one from China, one from Polish and Romania, and one from uh, Jordan. Uh, one experience I would like to uh, to share with you is a high-level team I had just this past week from uh, Amman, Jordan. It was a very high-level uh, trade team. Uh, it was from the Ministry of Supply, which is uh, just about like our Secretary of Agriculture here in the U.S. They uh, were on a trade mission uh, that was uh, developed where they would visit the Kansas area, Oklahoma, and then conclude in the Houston area. It consisted of three individuals, and uh, as I mentioned, they were very high level. Uh, I was aware that they were coming to Houston. Uh, I developed their itinerary. I got a call from Washington uh, several days before they were to come to Houston where I was to meet them, and they said that uh, they had some meetings with a company in Kansas City in which the head person was not, be able, was not able to talk to them. The second person was not able to talk to them. They were able to talk to the third or fourth person down the line that would not answer any of their questions. So they did not treat them very royally, as they wanted to be treated, as they do in the Middle East sometimes. And so the, the leader, which had to be called Your Excellency, said, uh, cancel the whole deal. Cancel the, all the appointments today and tomorrow. Let's go to Oklahoma. So we, I got a call in my office and said, uh, be aware of these guys. They're coming. They're very high level. Is there any way you can treat them royally? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, we thought we always treated our board guests nice and this sort of thing, so uh, consequently I called the hotel, we was able to upgrade the rooms to VIP, to suites, and this sort of thing, and also uh, a strict limo was waiting for them at the airport <laughs> to pick them up and take them uh, to the hotel, and uh, you mentioned at, at noon about the, the cultures, uh, since he did mention the, the fact about the seating and the vehicles, I did notice that His Excellency did sit on the, on the rear, on the right-hand side of the limo, which means that the driver on, in, in our cars is on the left-hand side. So uh, knowing about all this, well, I did kind of hold back and let him kind of take the lead there. And, kinda <laughs> take the lead there. But, uh, and it was also, uh, we had a U.S. wheat representative from our overseas foreign office with us this past week, and he did warn us in advance about some of these things. And also, when we went to restaurants, His Excellency had to order first, 
and also be served first. So uh, anyway, these were just some of the things that we encounter uh, when we are hosting these foreign trade teams. And uh, uh, one thing I will mention, they did enjoy their visit to Houston, the rooms, uh, the, uh, the limos. We don't do this very often, only on these certain circumstances. <laughs> I might point out, but uh, they left Houston and flew to Washington, D.C., where last week they tendered for 350 to 400,000 metric tons of wheat. So that made us very happy that uh, we think we satisfied them, and, and uh, anyway, they flew to Washington, were very happy, and tendered for a lot of wheat. And so uh, that's just one of the uh, instances that uh, we go through in Houston, but I, I really enjoy it, and culture does play a big part, as they mentioned at noon today, in hosting these foreign gifts. Um, Another part of our work is uh, once or twice a year, through our U.S. Wheat Associates, we have board team travel. Board team means the U.S. Wheat Associates Board of Directors, in which uh, Texas has two representatives on it. Once a year, there will be one team that goes to Europe and the Middle East, and uh, the other team will go to uh, Southeast Asia and the Asian market. I was uh, uh, able to participate this past year in a tour of the uh, Europe and the Middle East. Uh, the, the reason these uh, teams are developed, or these uh, board team, this board team travel is developed, is to uh, one is by U.S. wheat policy that they go once a year, and the Foreign Agriculture Service policy that we go to our overseas foreign offices, go through those offices, hear the various programs they have going on in regarding foreign market development in those various countries. Just for some examples, uh, we did uh, go to Moscow at a very touchy time when all the republics were breaking out. Instead of having one Russia, now we have 14 different republics. U.S. Wheat saw uh, the need for an overseas foreign office in Moscow we hadn't had in the, in the past. So I was there at our grand opening of our U.S. Wheat office in uh, Moscow at the Radisson Plaza there. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we did uh, uh, you know, they did break up into 14 different republics, so we felt a need, if we're making 14 different contacts in 14 different countries, there is a need for an office, uh, you know, simply located in the Republic of Russia, in Moscow. Uh, we did meet with uh, high-level export uh, individuals, export club, where they could explain to us what is actually going on there. Uh, we also went and visited several flour mills to see if they're satisfied with the wheat that we sell. That's just uh, one example. Another example is uh, we went into Cairo, Egypt, where uh, they had many flour mills there, where we visited them, met with the high-level government officials. We also toured a milling and baking school, which we helped fund uh, in Cairo to help uh, increase our demand of our uh, wheat products to, uh, to uh, Egypt. That's just an example of uh, some of the things we do with our board team travel. Uh, just this past week, I don't know how many of you listened to uh, KGNC, we were in Mexico City, we developed, uh, let's see, prior to last week, but, and let me just back up one moment uh, to give you a little background that for those of you that did not know about Conasupo in Mexico. Conasupo in the past was the head grain buying agency or government uh, grain bank buying agency for Mexico City. Within the last year or two, they have turned that over to the private sector, or they call it privatization. So. Uh, in consequence, the, the flour millers did not know how to buy wheat. So uh, seeing this need of educating the flour millers in Mexico, uh, we did develop a, a seminar over here to those grain companies that might be interested in selling grain to the individual flour millers in Mexico. We held a seminar in Fort Worth. We had about 100 participants from the various grain trade, private grain industry officials, and it was very well attended. To a follow-up to that, we had a seminar in Mexico City in Monterey to where we could bring those individuals interested that came to the Fort Worth meeting into Mexico to meet with the uh, flour milling officials, bring their order books, try to get more educated on how to do business with each other. And um, according to Bill Nelson, the executive vice president who, who participated in that, said it was very successful. And it was a very good trip, and uh, we're, we're going to be doing some follow-up on that uh, in the near future. I have told you about uh, some of the work we do, not because uh, you're not interested in wheat marketing, but uh, because any industry you are in, uh, there is probably an organization such as a trade association, uh, a council, or a federation that you can support 
that is related to the U.S. Department of Commerce, for example, where you can work together as a group for export market development. As a new exporter, it is better to identify with this approach rather than trying to do it uh, independently, which can be more cost costly and uh, less effective. In conclusion, uh, I'd like to ask this question. Do these generic type market development efforts uh, pay off? In Texas and the U.S., we are exporting three times as much wheat today than we were when we started these efforts several years ago. Thank you very much. questions for him right now. We'll take a few questions right now for him. I just <clears throat> wonder, did they specify the Jordanian Texas wheat rather than Kansas wheat? No, that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's one thing we're trying to get away from. In other words, that's why each state, 17 wheat states come together through U.S. Wheat Associates so that we're not fitting one state against each other. In other words, uh, if one state sale makes a sale, it benefits all the states. So we try to promote hard red winter wheat, or even the soft wheats up in the north. Anytime we're selling wheat, uh, there's that psychological effect in the markets, and you know how that works. So uh, we don't try to promote one state over the other. When you say the wheat, you mean you have the full wheat association, right? Sorry, uh, association. And the other is, uh, Independent, uh, independent company in Hong Kong wants to buy some wheat from here or from the United States. How can they do it? Do they have to prove the trade association? Or can they come? Uh, let me just explain. Uh, we don't buy or sell wheat. We're only market development organization. However, we do have trade contacts. And we do have an office in, in did you say Hong Kong? Yeah. We do have an office there. We would encourage uh, those people to Go to our office there. They have the list of contacts of the major grain companies or the smaller grain companies where they would be able to make a sale. That's uh, that's how we handle that situation. Question number two. Are you developing hard white winter wheat marketing program? There are some uh, hard white marketing programs being developed up in the, the Midwest and up in the Pacific Northwest. White winter wheat. White winter wheat, yes. Yes, but as far as uh, here in Texas, we aren't doing any of that in that we primarily grow the hard red winter wheat. As I mentioned in uh, part of my presentation, one of our largest efforts is our export market development work. The other effort is, of course, our uh, research uh, fund to the universities for uh, research on, uh, on wheat pro 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 projects. I thought maybe hard white winter wheat was being developed in the Kansas, Oklahoma area. There's some up in the uh, up in the, the Midwest being developed, but uh, right now I don't believe in Texas we're doing any research on that right now. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Mr. Paul Gross. He's uh, district director for the Texas Agricultural Experiment or uh, Extension Service uh, for Area One uh, out of Amarillo. He is a native of Hockley County. For some of you who don't know where that is, that's level land. Uh, out where the land is very rolling and hilly and <laughs> places like that, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he uh, received a degree in animal science from Texas Tech University and a master's from Texas A&M. Uh, served in the uh, Korean, or uh, with the Army in the Korean uh, conflict. Uh, he's been a county extension agent in Gaines County, Coward County, and Lowe's Counties, uh, and has been a uh, director here in uh, Amarillo for the extension service uh, since 1974. He has the upper 20 counties on your map uh, of the, uh, uh, the Panhandle, which is basically uh, Randall County and north and a line drawn across the bottom of Randall County. Uh, He's a member of the Extension Service uh, Texas chapter of Alpha Zeta Epsilon Sigma Phi. And uh, he's married and has four children and three grandchildren. Paul? Uh, I'll go get the lights for you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Appreciate it. 
Probably just going to echo a little bit here what Dr. Clark uh, has mentioned already about uh, <clears throat> agriculture and the importance of agriculture. We don't think a lot about agriculture until we the old uh, hands on the clock move up towards about 12 o'clock. Everybody in here got pretty interested in what agriculture means. <laughs> <laughs> That's all said, just turn the back on the RIs. That side's okay, just the very back part, just lift up a little bit, just the back of this whole thing. Oh, okay. the back. But, uh, I do have a little bit uh, of uh, experience myself in international marketing. Uh, when I was a young assistant county agent, we uh, uh, put in a few hogs. I had uh, started about four sales, and pretty soon I did about 50 registered sales. And they were good sales because uh, I bought up in the Midwest and tried to produce the best I could. It was down by in Texas. And so uh, I. Uh, I had a call one day from old Mexico, a fellow called me, said he wanted to come up and see my name in a trade journal, sell some hogs. We're looking for hogs. If you've got about 50 sounds, you're doing a good job, you get between 400 and 50, 500, 400 and 500 pigs, and half of them are female, and so that's what he was interested in. They were good set, he came up to look at them. When the car arrived there, it was a new car, a nice car, four people in that car. Uh, a little bit overwhelmed with that, but they got out and looked at those, and it was a good clean operation. And they walked through there. Two of those guys had the, the selection group. They could hear a number of these pigs, and they read those numbers on these pigs' ears, and they sat them down. And another guy had a chalk marker, he had marked them, and another had his notebook. When he got there, he said, We'll take these. I said, All right. And he said, How quick can you ship them? And I said, Just as quick as you pay me. And he said, Well, this may cause no problem. And I had one. I said, I want cash if I can get it. And he said, Well, we normally get a check. I said, Don't believe one of the parking lots. I had a little conference with my banker on <laughs> previous occasions. He was kind of concerned that he had some money on the hogs and sold them. So uh, anyway, uh, we agreed that he'd send me the money. Within well, about two weeks, I did tell him, I said, I'll take good care of these hogs. I'll ship them to you just as a guarantee. And uh, so about two weeks, I got a check to a bank in San Francisco. I carried over my banker and said, is this, is this piece of paper good? And he said, you bet you. Put it in the bank. We had the hogs on the way. Now, there's a couple of principles there. One is that if if he had left with those hogs, one of them would have died over there too. They might have been mine. But by gosh, if I had my money, that's his. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't know a whole lot about international trade, but I knew about this. The other thing for you guys from Lubbock, I worked in Lubbock. The first marketing I really saw down there at the market was in Cotton in Lubbock, Texas. And they did a super job out there. They had a lot of cotton, had a lot of the warehouse. We went out there one time. They had all this cotton graded and blast, and they could call in from Cory or wherever. They can take this cotton and ship that cotton out of there with so many bales, so many containers of the right grade and everything. That was a real eye for me. I might also mention a little marketing thing there. I had a lot of foreign visitors. Rodney talked about here when I was a county agent down there about once a week. We're close to that chamber of commerce. I think we've got an excellent chamber of commerce down there. These trade groups would come in. We had a fellow came in one time, a huge black fellow. Now, I understand the country that he came from, they paid him by the weight that he had, I don't know, you probably know what country he is, I don't know, but anyway, the bigger you get, the more money you get. He was a huge guy, 400 pounds, so we got a funeral car to haul him around. <laughs> Went out to a cotton gin, it wasn't cotton gin, you see, right there in the east level, where he used to have that old gym, but the sale barn down there. Walked in there, and they had a little cotton, they started all this gin up. It's in the spring, and of course, it wasn't even getting cotton. He looked at that thing a little bit, and he said, I want to buy a gin just like this. And it caused a lot of commotion. It wasn't a gym for seven loads. It wasn't really balanced. They finally called Phoenix. They got him gym. He bought gym that day. That fellow bought gym that day. So there's a lot of different things in trade. <laughs> <laughs> now then, Dr. Clark has told you a little bit about this area here that we're in. I just made this a little bit bigger about the Pan Am South Plains because all that cotton production down there. Just echo what he said. This is a tremendous agricultural country here. When we look at the state of Texas, we're number one in farms and ranches and cattle, and we're number one in sheep and goats and hogs. And when we look at the United States as a whole, then when we narrow that thing down to this area right here, people, this is where the action is. Anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of our ag income comes out of this area right here where we're living right here. That gives us some real opportunities, I think, in this area uh, that we maybe are not uh, have a thought about some. We're looking at cattle feed yards here. This is a kind of just a small room here. It's one of our big cattle feed yards here. We feed an awful lot of cattle in this industry here out here, and that means an awful lot of ag dollars to people. I don't think they realize what's happening in this industry here. 
another phase of this is wheat pasture cattle. We run multitudes of cattle here on wheat pasture. We can harvest that wheat if we can grace it out and go for grain and go for depending on the price of wheat over here, the body history does. I might give a plug here for a commodity group. You know, in this area here, we've got the Texas wheat growers, we've got Southwestern Public Service, they're not a, not a private group, so to speak, as far as commodities, but they're certainly a big agricultural help to us and everyone else here in this area. We've got the Port Horse Association, we've got the Texas Cattle Feeders, located down the road, we've got the Grain Farming Feeders headquarters right down the road, this is all for Texas. We've got the Sugar Bean Association over here at the Bell, uh, uh, over here at Bell Ray, anyway, and then we've got the Corn Growers over here at Denny. So we've got a lot of these big agricultural associations right here in this area that represent agriculture here. This is the important part of our area here, Stockton County. We bring in many, many Stockton cattle to help our wheat cross the picture a whole lot right here. <clears throat> this is a field of wheat. It's a little bit hard to say. I'm not going to say much more about it. Bob, the uh, talk about that. That picture's not quite a right. Folks, I think here is the crop that brought the cattle feeding industry to Pan Am, Texas, right here. We have a lot of we have a lot of grain started here. We have a lot of cattle. We trucked this for years. We trucked this crop out here in Arizona, California, all over. They fed this crop. Uh, we we trucked our calves out of here. It's always been a big cattle state here. We trucked those out of here. Now we decided maybe we'll do something about that several years ago, and that's, that's the very reason right there. That's one of the big reasons I think we have the cattle feeding industry here today. This is not a good human food crop for us. Now some countries like this crop. We're basically in some of the other things here. Corn is uh, certainly an important crop, probably a lot of corn, corn silage, corn crop goes into the cattle feeding industry here in this area here. Uh, sugar beets, uh, number one in sugar beet production in this area. Uh, sugar people are a little concerned about the NAFTA agreement right here. What's this going to, what kind of back doors is this going to open up if we get into this thing? There are one group that's a little concerned, I'll talk about some other groups that are happy to talk about this. Some flowers, a minor crop, but we've got several of these. Texas ranks number one in hay crops in this whole country. Uh, if you want to talk about a crop that's important to us, we've got soybeans, we've got sunflowers, we've got guar, we've got a number of these crops that are important in this area here. Some vegetables, mostly in uh, over in the Herford area. When I came up here, we had 15 packing sheds. Labor, restrictions, we've got one left, and probably that's not going to last any much longer. That's going to go somewhere else. We've heard a lot of that in this area here. There's your grain sorghum that's uh, cutting in from the field or cutting over here. That's the crop that uh, has helped make this cattle feed industry what it is. Here's the other thing, is a good supply of underground water. Don't ever forget this. I was almost heart sick to talk about digging this pit over here at Death's Mill. Any chance we might have to run this water, folks, don't get drug in on something that can happen to us to run this water supply. We're setting over a great formation running all the way up from the, through Nebraska, and that's the only supply we've got, and it is good. We're finding out we may not own this thing because of every soccer power, what happened. <laughs> the legislation got the most things up. We need this water. It may be gone. But anyway, right now, agriculture can use that. We've developed a lot of good methods in production of water. This is a low energy. We're using less water. We used to run it down the road. This is a system of circles for all electricity over here getting married. But it's certainly an efficient way to water and to handle crops in this area. You can see on the bottom here, this is a little spray nozzle that's developed in these low efficiency irrigation things where we can spray chemicals up in there. If you, see, if you ever see a, uh, anyone really taking off alcohol of agriculture on the chemical usage, they've got an airplane, they're spraying chemical. You can put chemical right through this with the water goes up down and leaves there, kills the bugs out, and actually the water through there. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about our beef pasture here plants. In 1992, I got this in Southwestern Public Service data. They, uh, they go out and survey these people. But we, we slaughtered nearly 5 million head cattle here in 1992. Uh, 12 plants here with total capacity of something, 5 and 40 million head of kill capacity here. Now then let's look at some of these area largest plants here. We've got Iowa beef processors down the road. They knocked down about one and three quarter, uh, big, big and three quarter, uh, 750,000 head. We've got Montford up at Edder, a little over a uh, million head there. We've got Exo with a couple of plants, one out here playing you over here in Palmer County. That gives you some idea of the magnitude of what's happening in the cattle industry here, what happened. This again, we look at the feed yards where these are coming out of, uh, two, almost three million head of total capacity, but we turn those over. You only feed these cows for about 120 days or so, so the road, some years is two and a half, depending on, on what you can get out of the cattle. Some of them are a little slower about filling, some look faster. Normally we'll go up from two and a half to a, or, or roughly three times a year to turn those cattle to get us up close to that packing capacity that Dr. Clark talked about a few minutes ago. Let's stop just a minute and look at what. This is, uh, this is from the U.S. Meat Export Federation here, 
And right now on beef exports, this is their projection right here. Right now, we're sitting right here on about $3 billion worth of exports in beef. Now, you can look and see what they're talking about here in the year 2000. You think there's not some opportunities going to happen if we're on the boat, we can ride the boat with the folks who make me something out of this right here. But it's almost a gradual increase from about, it just steps up here to about double for the year 2000. That's not very far. Now let's talk just a bit about the pork business. I told you that's kind of important man to start with. We're going to get by that bad. Um, <laughs> if we look down in Old Mexico, there's some real opportunities in Old Mexico. <clears throat> this is what happened in 1992. <clears throat> about $13 million worth of live homes, live ones for breeding purposes, 76 or 77 million pork, and variety meats. So they use a lot of these things we're not going to use down here. They do it real efficiently in what they do. Large, what you got there. So when you look at that, that's a pretty good package. This will, will if we can get NAFTA, well, here's a group right here, the Pork Boys, they're strong behind that. They want to trade with Mexico. We've got an import deal down there right now, and we ship anything at 20% on Mexico. If we can get that thing keep down, it's going to make them more dollars. Some of them are saying that if we can get this NAFTA trade agreement between the pork industry, that hogs will be a dollar a pound here for the end of the 10-year period. And beef cattle, you know, have always been brought more than hogs, probably. You know, you ever wonder about the developing countries, what's the first meat to eat? Eat chicken. Why? Because I go down to the grocery store and buy chicken for 79 cents a pound. Costs a pound and a half, pound and three-quarter feet, get that on that chicken. Double that price, double your feed, you got your hog business. Double that, which the price is the price. You can go down here and buy your beef for Three fifty, four dollars a pound, seven or eight pounds of beef, get a pound of beef. So beef is going to be the last thing that underdeveloped people can use. They're going to use chicken, pork, beef, simple beef economics. It's just cheaper to buy meat. Did you ever wonder why a lot of those underdeveloped countries they use rice? And what do you find in it? You don't go see a big beef steak. You see a little bit of duck cut up in there, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of pork. They just cut it up in there. Meat is scarce and hard to come out. But as these countries get more profitable. What are they going to buy? They're going to buy better cuts of pork, better cuts of beef, and if the market's out there. Okay, let's look at our assets just a minute. Higher quality and plentiful supply of raw materials and food products that we can ship out here. Folks, there's nobody in the world who's got the products that we've got to ship in the way of food products here. I don't care who it is. I go out here, I don't care what 60 minutes says or anybody else. You can go out here to IBP and I'm impressed with the quality of the meat that comes out there. Sometimes it'll be some little something slip. But when you look at all the millions of pounds of meat and carcasses that go out of there, we have a real good track record on this thing. Available finance. A lot of these countries don't have finance. And we've heard this all the time. You better be careful how you finance. We have that finance. If you have a good, solid industry to promote, somebody will loan you the money or help you get in that business. Um, technology. There's nobody in the world about technology. We've got this country. I remember back when I was candidates in Lubbock, Texas, 1970s. When they launched this satellite up here, about 17,000 miles, and went around this earth up here, one day a month, agriculture got the use of that satellite. Dr. Marion Bumgarner, who's real here, buddy from Texas, up at Purdue. Purdue got the contract on that thing. He came off down there at Lubbock, and we took producers over about a 10 county area, and every day about 10 producers, and they went out on those farms, and that thing came over one day a month, and they told him what was on the ground. If it was cotton, if it was skip rope, if it had been irrigated, if it was blooming, if it had worms in it, if it was feed crop, if it was corn, if it was vegetables, if it had been irrigated, if it rained the day before, what stage of growth is in, if it was blooming, he got all of that data put in his computer. We were circling the earth with this satellite. We knew what was down there. We could see what was down there, but we could not tell what it was. After we got through with that exercise there, he could tell, but he went over. We know exactly what is happening in Russia. We know what's happening in China. We can pick it out. When we had to buy, buy corn blind a few years ago up in Indiana, planted all of one uh, type of corn up there, a blight hit it before that blight ever hit that country. We could pick it up off the of infrared um, units off of that, but there was something wrong with that corn crop. We couldn't tell what it was because it happened when it happened. It was a disaster. But we've got technology that you wouldn't believe that we've got in this country, and we can do things with them utilizing that technology to see what's happening. High education level along the food production chain, and I the key word here is food production chain. We, on, on the trading in that, we got sharp people trading. Mexico, China, Korea, everywhere we trade, those people are sharp that match our people trading. 
But folks, when you get out of that and come down here, when I spent my time in Korea, I was an old country kid over there, and I wasn't over there looking for me, but I did see a lot of it. And there was an old boy over there, uh, I'd go to those rice paddies, and he had an old Georgia stock plow, and they'd drag that old plow with an old water buffalo or something out across there. And he was plowing in water. I couldn't figure out how in the world he went and roll across that place. <laughs> I guess he knew what he did. I came back later on, and this poor devil had his pants left rolled up, and he was setting that rice out in there. I came back a little while later, they, the rice was growing, they harvested that rice by hand with reapers. They brought it in, they used these buffalo to crump that up, they winded that grain. Now that's a far cry from some of this big machine that we got right here. As far as, as what we get into as far as, as level, uh, education levels and things like that, in our work we, we develop a plan that we look at through our county engine program. I was over Collinsworth County two or three years ago. They had seven, they had nine farmers in there that working on a plan. I'm looking at what was happening in that county, what they're doing, what they want, what kind of educational programs they want in that county. Seven of that nine had college degrees. Five of those had master's degrees. Sitting in that room working on the plan. You'll not find that anywhere else except right here in the United States of America. We've got good equipment, roads, and transportation system. I've been to Old Mexico several times. One of, one of the things I noticed most, you look down one of those mountains, Looks like it's a mile at the bottom there hauling bananas out of there on a little small donkey, a couple of packs on that little He's struggling to get up the thing. It takes him over how long to get there. They left the side of the road, they pick it up. They don't have nearly the, the roads and equipment we've got. The other thing is, with this NAFTA thing being developed, we've got a lot of opportunities. In Kansas, Nebraska, they're talking about roadways right now. We're not very interested. I hope I'm going to look at that. I'd like to see I-27 be a roadway for some of this stuff that's going to make stuff if this happens. And regardless of where the NAFTA comes in, we're going to trade with Mexico. You can bet on that. We're going to trade. NAFTA is another vehicle if we use it right and don't mess up. Don't let them mess us up. It's kind of like we get out somewhere we can park this road. It's kind of like old Yogi Bar. I like old Yogi. Come on, come on. Good things. And Yogi says, you come to the parking road, take it. And that's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> get to the parking road, take it. Now let's look at their assets. Cheap labor and plenty of I worked some of those poor ends over there. Good workers. I've worked some people out of old Mexico on my farm. If they came across a little bit of wet bags, they were good hands. If they came across with a green card, it was called green cards, it was called ceros, a number of different things. I've seen a hundred of them in a row picking cotton, brought up here with some gin, picked cotton, hand cotton, had them on my farm doing that. They're good, they're good workers. They don't have the technical ability to do what to do, but they've got a lot of labor. We better remember this concerns some people here on what they have. The other thing here, the favorite time for truth and best. Uh, we've got a good climate here for what we do. We need some cold weather, but down there when it's cold and icy here, they can be producing some crops down there in that country. We can't produce it. See some of the pretty strawberries out there. People have got concerns. Are they going to have the same regulations we've got, and we need to have a level playing field on that? Less regulations, less government control. Agriculture is getting choked to death with regulations. Every time we turn on that new regulation, they may choke us plumb out of this thing. That's the biggest fear I have about agriculture today, is how much regulation can we take? We're the best stewards of the land. We want to have a cleaner product than anybody. But we seem like everybody else. You can take some movie star out here that, that's, that has no idea about what it is, and they can get up and expand on all the bad things wrong with agriculture, and everybody says, that's the way it is. I can spend my whole career trying to tell somebody, and nobody believes in what we tell them. But I'm telling you, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's about what I have. I'm going to quit there. I've enjoyed visiting with you. I appreciate the, the opportunity to come and visit with you. Thank you. circle systems, but to get that water down where we have less evaporation rate, very little evaporation rate. In fact, we're getting 95% efficiency out of these circle systems. The other is 57% efficiency. So there's a lot of difference in how we put that water on. 
Now, another thing that's happened, uh, 30 years ago, we thought this old law formation was gone. Uh, Kay Ledbetter said he back here did an article a while back on, uh, uh, we tried to get water out of the Mississippi. We tried to get it out of Canada. Several years ago, there were a number of things. We tried to bring water in here. But we've got to the point now that we, we realize that we had to be careful with this water. But the, the, the droppage in that water table has, has really it's, it's slowed down tremendously. We're not taking the near the water out we did at one time. We're watering about as many acres and doing a good job. It is costly. It's power to, to, to move these things. That's the reason the producer's got to have some margin of profit if he's going to operate out here. Uh, folks, we're under a cheap food policy in this country. People say something about government payments and, and farmers drawing this and farmers drawing that, but if you throw everything off and turn it loose, you're not going to be able to go to the grocery store and buy food at the price you're buying now. I know some of you think that food may be a little high, but it, it'll change if the government, a lot of that, that money that that farmer gets is a pass-through for you and me as a consumer to have cheap food. Yes. Is the, uh, is the nuclear gun is that Especially dead and gone. We hear it is, and then we hear, well, DOE's back in Hershey's probably. You don't ever know. This is a problem. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take a stand. I, I'm not supposed to, but I will. I, I believe I've been strong enough that I'm worried. I don't think we can afford. This is the bread basket of the world we saw. This is, the, this is it. And I'm going to take a stand. I always have. And I know a lot of people that look at other scientific data, and there's always articles, and I, know that I read those every day. I look at those things and what can happen, what doesn't happen. But I just don't think that we can ever guarantee that we can make any kind of storage in this country over this water table here and be safe with them. And folks, if something gets in there and it ruins it, this thing's a desert. We forget. What happened to that concept of siphoning in Mississippi? I bet those people would like it. Well, had that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was Okay, six billion dollars into or plus into trying to restore that Mississippi River deal there. I think if we could have started in the beginning, see there were there were designs made to bring that water in here, store some over the little field, all different areas here to bring this water in here. And I was one that worked on that. I wanted that to happen because I thought water's our life here, there's no question about that. But well, number one, East Texas said at that time they didn't need water. They had plenty they found out later they needed water. Uh, the folks all up and down, all up and down in Mississippi, they do not want to park with that water. I don't care if we don't get it done. We had one of the professors from the University of Texas that testified and said it's going to ruin all the shrimp beds in the Gulf Coast if all that fresh water doesn't work. I don't know if it will or not. But there were all too many obstacles and the dollars were involved. And as one thing just kind of failed down the road, the whole thing just kind of failed. But I don't know, I, I doubt. And then the other thing that happened when the energy shot up here, See, at one time we could have brought piping or canals or whatever part of it with the gravity flow system. But as, as, the, uh, uh, as the energy went up, then it gets where it's not even feasible to consider that. As long as we, when that was first being considered, cheap energy, labor was down, we had a whole lot better chance to do that than we went to that. That's, it just kind of fits with that. But there were about four plans in that thing, starting one of them was Canadian, one of them was out of Nebraska, one of them was somewhere else. And finally, so that's going to hit the Mississippi. We'll put a channel of blocks and so on and bring that water back up here and use it up here. But none of them flip. Yes. Do you see any uh, more effort by farmers or infrastructure or academics, government, of applying the technology that's been sitting on the shelf left from dust? Is there well, this is our role. So, yeah. uh, this is our role as extension service. We that's that's our role is to get this get this information out. I think we're way ahead of other countries. We probably haven't got everything out because technology is being developed so, so rapidly and so many things are happening. Uh, another thing here, Dr. Clark's worked on this thing. He worked at Texas Tech for a while. You know, you can take a, uh, I, I get amazed so in the human element of the things I read when we had the first uh, test tube babies. Man, they made big and low. Dr. Clark had worked on this for long before he he, he was part of of doing this in the animal world, not the human world, but in the animal world. Uh, you can take an embryo, fertilize it in the cow, flush that out of that cow, not surgically, just flush it out. Take a scalpel or a razor blade and divide that in four or eight pieces, depending on the stage of growth, put that back in the cow, and you've got clones of that in all these calves that come out of it. He's done that work. In Dr. Long, did that work in Texas Tech. It's been done a lot of places. But we've got technology happening so fast uh, that it's, it's really hard to keep up and keep people up and just to stay up with the technology that's happening. In machinery, someone mentioned this morning why we don't export all this machinery overseas. It's just simply the fact that a lot of those people 
if you, if you were traveling down this highway here, Mexico's up here buying these farms. There's all these old two-cylinder tractors pulling a binder. They go every week in this fast they can. They're not buying the big equipment, but they can put them on small units, small farms, and truck this stuff out there. So uh, technology's moving in a hurry on us. Can't, are we getting it to the street fast enough for any faster? Well, I won't know. We'd like to think it might be, maybe we're not. One of the problems with some of the technology is public acceptance of it. For example, the genetically engineered tomatoes, okay, they can harvest tomatoes now three, four weeks before they ripen, put them in a box, they're as green as gold, ship them all the way across the country, all the way around the world. When they get there, they can put them in a storage unit, refrigerate them in, in a certain period of time, supposedly, I've never eaten one now, but they tell me that that tomato will taste like the one you just went out in the garden and picked off the vine. But the problem is, is getting the people to accept part of that technology, because what have we done to get that? We've messed with Mother Nature. We've got foreign DNA in some of those tomatoes. Do you want to eat foreign DNA? Doesn't bother me. Okay? Uh, BST in milk is another one, okay? That type of thing. We didn't have milk for lunch today, but if we had, there's growth hormone in that milk that you buy down at the store that the cow puts in there naturally. And so, one of the big problems in getting some of that technology accepted is getting the consumer to buy it. And as he mentioned about the movie stars and the other uh, alarmists and whatever you want to call those people that are out there uh, that have a little bit of knowledge that are extremely dangerous. And they take something that's probably the size of a mold and they build it into a mountain range. Right quick. And it doesn't make any difference how long Paul and I stand up and talk about it. We cannot put all that down. That they can build it up in two minutes and it take us a lifetime to put it down. So that's part of the problem in getting some of the technology. Not all of it, but some of it. Well, we need to move on. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Mary Blenderman. She's with uh, Southwestern Public Service, as several people have already alluded to. She's a business development specialist for them. She's a member of the economic development staff, and her primary duties include working with manufacturers and producers in the Panhandle in the South Plains of Texas to assist them with retention and expansion projects. And a lot of you have probably seen some of their ads on TV where they promote businesses, not only agriculture, but other businesses in this area too, trying to get business to move into to this area. She got a BS degree in home economics from the University of Texas. Uh, she's been employed with SPS for 12 years, and uh, I won't read a lot of the other things that are on here, but uh, she moved from Miami, Florida to Texas in 1975, and I would have to guess that was a culture shock, particularly when she planted <laughs> up here, okay? <laughs> Right. I made the gradual change. I went to the hue and the hospital. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's been a really good seminar so far today. I'm, I hope you all have gotten good information. Thank you. 
formulated a, another sector of economic development called business retention and expansion, which we designed and are now implementing. And basically what I do is I go out into the SPS territory and I have targeted small to medium-sized manufacturers, and that would include agriculture sector too, and am doing personal, confidential, one-on-one -on -one interviews with these folks. And basically what I, I do is I talk to them about certain issues. Uh, say employment issues, uh, maybe their supplier base, their transportation uh, methods of getting their product out of the area, their, the government regulations that they face, uh, look at the growth of the company, whether it's growing or declining, uh, look at their expansion goals, or even possibly try to see if there's any red flags during the interview to try to help them address those issues. And out of these interviews, that we have been doing, I've been doing them, and I have a counterpart in New Mexico um, that does the same thing. Um, we ask questions, we have a one page devoted to export, and we try to find out if they're exporting presently, what countries they're exporting to, or if they have an interest in exporting. And we are finding from these interviews that yes, they, um, there's a surprising amount of people in the area that are doing exporting, and not only that, but there are people that are interested in exporting if they're not. So because we have seen um, an interest in this, and also because as we attend seminars out of our area, some related to the utility industry, for example, we know that exporting is here to stay. It's been talked about over the past 10 years and it's kind of been a word people kind of bantered around, but now I think that it is a here and now issue. Uh, for example, the Edison Electric Institute, which uh, our utility company participates in, has a program. <coughs> I attended the seminar, and we have purchased the manual. It's a manual for how utility companies can help in the exporting process. And um, there are many utility companies in the United States right now that are doing a lot of direct assistance, doing it in various stages of helping their industries in their area into the exporting process. So a part of my component is to help companies to export. And um, basically, I'm, I might say that what we do, we are not technicians. I'm certainly not a specialist in this field. I have a lot to learn. I'm continuing to go to ongoing seminars and training sessions so that I will be a little bit more literate in this field. But uh, we are really a referral resource. What we do is we locate, again, federal, state, and regional, and local resources, and then when a company says they have an interest in a certain field, say exporting, then we can pull in those resources and direct them to those resources. Sometimes they're out there. This has been talked about this morning, but it's pretty overwhelming, I think, especially when I, I go out and I interview a company that maybe has 50 employees, or I interview the mom and pop in for them to try to kind of filter through this maze of resources there. There is a wealth, that's true. But I find that um, if I can direct them, kind of give them a guideline and give them the name of somebody to call, or even call for them, as Deborah Hernandez said this morning, um, if you have a question that you want answered by Deborah or anybody in her, on her staff, um, I can tell you this, that it's part of my job would be that I can talk to you about
have some reference manuals on hand. Again, I'm going to kind of repeat, but I won't go into great detail, the basic guide to exporting, which I'm sure Pat Helton will tell you is really important. We are subscribing, too, to the Journal of Commerce. Um, I'm keeping up with that. I, I can't. I think it's an excellent um, paper to subscribe to. Uh, we also subscribe to, again, the Business America, which Pat brought up. And then um, at the Ag Exporter. So those of you that are interested in Ag, this is another good magazine. There's excellent articles in it. There's um, just a lot of wealth of information. We um, subscribe to three electric, uh, electronic bulletin boards. And again, Deborah Hernandez to talk to you about the uh, Texas marketplace. I have some packets in the back, which um, we'll pass out to you and you'll get some information on that. But again, if, if you don't have a personal computer, you don't have a modem, um, I'll be glad to help you uh, get your product listed on the uh, Texas Marketplace. It's a buyer, it's a player, it's a player matchmaking system. Um, you can come to my office anytime, just give me a call and you can see how it operates. There are international trade leads on that. Uh, I'll kind of give you a story that I think is a, is a fun story well in, in this packet have to see an article, a newspaper article, about two ladies down in Briscoe County, down in Silverton. <laughs> and um, you may think that, you know, we're talking about some real traditional ag here, but I'm going to give you some sort of, um, let's say, alternative agricultural opportunities in the area. Now, these ladies live in Silverton. They grew up on a ranch, and um, what was somebody's became or had the potential to become their source of making money. And I'm talking about broom weed. Are y'all familiar with that? Uh, I'm sure you are. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. anyway, it's something that uh, ranchers don't care for too much, but believe it or not, it's something that people, especially in Europe, are using. Uh, the floral, the forests are using them. Uh, fresh flowers are very expensive. So they take this dry broom weed, which kind of looks like baby bread, that's it's dry. It can be bleached, it can be dyed. But what they do is they uh, place it in their floral arrangement, kind of as a filler. And it's also, you can go to Michael's and you can see it, you can see it um, any place where they sell arts and crafts. Well, they decided <coughs> that actually somebody from someplace else came in one year and started asking if they could pick it off their ranch because they were selling it. So they decided, well, if they're going to do it, why don't we just go ahead and do it ourselves? So um, one of the ladies' husbands is a judge there in Silverton, and he um, said, well, I've got some labor here for you. <laughs> you know, if they want to go out, my um, parolees or people who come out of the county jail here, we'll give them an opportunity to make some money. Well, actually, they like doing it. So they went out on the, on the ranches and started picking the broom weed. And um, last year was a pretty good year. Uh, there's a man down in Floyd Ada who exports it, 
Four in a ten to ten. <laughs> You know, a lot of ranchers that just like <laughs> So again, uh, they are making, I guess you might say, lemonade out of lemons, you know, and then, um, if this works, um, they're going to be providing some basic dollars going into Silverton, Silverton's a small community. It needs the money, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, a huge business here. I'm talking about a small cottage industry. But as I go out to the small community, I know that something like that is very important. As these two ladies said last year alone, and when they first began, they brought $20,000 into the community through Silverton by, by um, selling this product. And that, that means something in the community by the Silverton. So that's an example of some alternative agriculture. Um, another story I have is a fellow who uh, runs a business in Beta, Texas.
also IRC. Now, they didn't want anybody to know what they were doing a couple years ago because they did they and all on the thought, this is probably isn't going to work and everybody thinks we're crazy because we're going into, we're diversifying, we're doing something else besides the traditional uh, products that are, are produced here. Well, they're doing very well with their piano rolls and they are also being exported. Now, they are not they are not directly exporting them, but they're going through a distributor who is exporting lots of those to Holland right now. So again, here we have somebody else that I consider to be kind of a weird product for this part of the country, but is using that product in the market, a good part of it is going into international trade. So those are just kind of three examples of what can be done in the area. Uh, in the packet that you'll get today, there is some information on the marketing tools and, and the ones that I highly recommend. Again, Deborah Hernandez was here this morning and kind of went over what the Texas Department of Commerce has to offer. But I feel that the Texas Department of Agriculture has very strong programs for people that are getting into um, marketing their products. They have product, they have programs called the Taste of Texas. And here again, I, I'll point out that the Texas Miss Pig is here. Um, to export your product and you get that little taste of Texas logo on it, uh, you're going to have a much better chance of selling it to the staff pension. Um, and $25 is the application. You send it off to Austin and they will get you into the taste of Texas because that's for food products. The Texas Brown Park uh, Program is a horticulture program of Pride of the Plains Gulf Farms.
getting into the case of Texas, the Texas Department of Agriculture programs, he is getting a wealth of information and opportunities to help him. He has been um, granted a loan through the Texas Department of Agriculture, Texas um, Agricultural Finance Authority, and um, that he can help market his program and he can help his state and his product. So, so I, I would think that for the agricultural segment, definitely wants to get involved with the Texas Department of Agriculture. We have agents here in the local region who can get you uh, involved in it. You don't have to go down to Austin. Some of you probably know who Bedford Forrest is. He's been in our area for years and years. He is now our uh, area uh, Texas Department of Ag representative, marketing representative for the Amarillo and the Panhandle region. And then we have <coughs> regional office in Lubbock, and what they do is they, they do the footwork, they go out and visit one-on-one -on -one with companies, I've had Bedford go out and visit with Lee Hilter in Vega, and um, by helping him, by going out there, and he does kind of what I do, we sort of handhold, we step people along the way, we, we kind of make it easier for them to access the resources that are available, uh, things can be done. So that's kind of where I'm coming from right now. And um, again, I think we have a lot of potential for exporting in the area. And, and I think that one thing we, we might look at is developing networks where people can get together informally and talk about our problems, talk about what our needs might be. And I think that we can really grow as an area as far as getting exports going, especially in the value added. Mary, I'm at Texas, Texas. We work with the company, the <coughs> uh, National Trade Database, on their online service. We download it. We look at all the other debates, 100 leads a day. We have no more money to share, craft, and buy us books and stuff. But we had one we came over with a pure thing about a year ago. And we were competing against the closing hand producers in Nebraska. And we made a tender, and the tender was for 100 times, 100 times the time. And we didn't, we got a so so reception, so we went back and rebid the tender with the producer out of Toledo Springs, Texas, and tendered it and marketed it as, well, he'd have to tell you that it was genuine, it wasn't genuine, it was genuine <laughs> Texas clover mesquite, genuine Texas mesquite wooden honey. Uh, they increased the order to 400 tons just because it was genuine Texas. <laughs> 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 and our, our friends in Nebraska are not real happy with it. <laughs> That's the power of Texas in the market. <laughs> so, what do you call that data, Mike? National Trade Data. And don't you all have it here? It's in your folder. But okay. you have the, you're online with it, aren't you? Yes, we do. Are you online in your CD-ROM? Yeah, we have CD-ROM okay. in our library. You can get online for daily download. I CD think I have to check with them, but we do have CD-ROM. Okay. And it's also my understanding that the um, Small Business Development Center in Lubbock is looking at getting involved with the Texas Department of Agriculture. Our department has looked at it too. Um, we're kind of waiting to see. We don't want to duplicate services. So we're looking to see what Lubbock Small Business Development Center is doing if they're going to get online with this because if they are, then anybody, all you have to do is call down there and ask a question, ask for certain data, and they'll be able to do that. Or you can go down there and, and, and in person too. So again, there are a lot of days of databases, there's a lot of information out there, and I, I am building up again a resource list of want to see what the Texas Marketplace does, come on up and visit with me. I'll be glad to show it to you anytime. And again, you can put your products on there. I'll be glad to 
agriculture and some of the export opportunities that are here and value-added things and various things like that. I just leave you with a couple of thoughts. Production agriculture in this country employs about two and a half percent of the population. It's not very much. Years ago, it was a lot higher than that. But about 16 to 20 percent of the people work in some agricultural related type business, whether it's processing, transportation, shipping, various other kinds of things. And of course, we in agriculture like to think every one of you are involved in agriculture. Why? Because you ate today. Okay? <laughs> so thank you very much. Short break, very yeah. short break. Ten minutes break and then we start our last session. Okay. Thank you.